In this eight-part series, I discuss problems common to philosophy and to religion. My focus is our confrontation with nihilism, the fear that our lives and the world itself may be meaningless. In this seventh part, I address the program of a religious revolution. There are three possible points of departure for such a revolution. A first point of departure is the continuing conflict between the promises of the struggle with the world and our established beliefs, ways of life, and social arrangements. The struggle with the world is the spiritual orientation, rooted in the Semitic religions of salvation and in the modern secular projects of liberation, that exercises the greatest authority all over the planet. But its message remains in conflict with the way we live and with many of our established beliefs. A second point of departure for the religious revolution is our willingness to recognize the ineradicable flaws in human life for what they are. In its first stage, religion was chiefly concerned with responding to the terrors of nature, on which we were entirely dependent. Then, religion took as one of its main concerns the denial of the incurable defects in the human condition, our mortality our groundlessness, our insatiability, and apparently as well, our susceptibility to belittlement. A new moment in the religious history of mankind would begin when we renounce this temptation to deny the the flaws in human life. A third point of departure for the religious revolution has to do with the fourth of these defects, our susceptibility to belittlement. The set of beliefs that exercises the greatest authority around the world promises to humanity elevation to a higher life, if not to eternal life, a greater share in the attributes that we ascribe to divinity. It is not only the Near Eastern religions of salvation, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam, that make this promise. It is also the secular projects of emancipation, the political programs of democracy, liberalism, and socialism, and the cultural revolutionary program of the Romantic movement, especially in the form of the worldwide popular Romantic culture, with its message that every ordinary man and woman is godlike. This promise continues to contradict the tenor of our ordinary experience, squandered as it is in compromise and in belittlement. A major focus of the religious revolution 
would be to take this promise seriously and to ask how it can be translated into forms of consciousness, into orientations to existence, and into ways of organizing society. A religious revolution that begins from these three points of departure can take either a sacred or a profane form. It can place the narrative of our ascent within a larger story of transactions between God and humanity, or it can confine itself to a purely secular story of cumulative transformation. It matters whether the religious revolution takes a sacred or a secular form. We should resist the characteristic contemporary temptation to split the difference between belief and non-belief in the existence of God and in his saving intervention in the world. The halfway house of partial belief would render the doctrines of the Semitic salvation religions as a kind of mythology, as an allegorical translation of what we are inclined to believe anyway. The halfway house is an instrument of self-deception. And at the same time, it is almost invariably a tool for the defense and reproduction of our conventional moral and political pieties. We should insist on the separation of the two directions. We should not imagine that there is some easy way out from the conundrums and the risks of a religious revolution by simple faith in a transcendent deity. Such a faith always doubles the bet and aggravates the disparity that always exists between the weightiness of any spiritual commitment and the inadequacy of the grounds for making it. Our perplexities are increased by the incoherence or the insufficiency of any idea of God that is available to us. If we picture God as a person and our relations to him by analogy to the interactions among individuals, we run the risk of a crude anthropomorphic projection of our longings and fears. If we imagine God as impersonal being, we run the risk of reducing him to the natural world and thus making him superfluous. And if we take refuge in the residual conception of God as a non-person and non-being, we simply represent as idea what is in fact the failure of the intellect. But suppose we were to extend the sacred track of the religious revolution. What in general would be its form, and specifically its form 
in the future of Christianity. It would require a radical development or renovation of the theology of redemption, of incarnation, or of imminence. Against the risks of Pelagianism, the view that salvation occurs solely within history, stand the risks of world abandonment, to which the Semitic religions of salvation have always been and remain susceptible. If salvation is possible at all, although extending beyond history, it must begin now. And the divine must live within the world. And its indwelling in the world must be manifest in a series of moral and political transformations. The presence of the divine within the world makes it possible for us to distance ourselves from the established structures and to accelerate the dialectic between engagement in circumstance and transcendence over context that is the defining attribute of our humanity. In this intervention, I want chiefly to outline the program of a religious revolution in a profane form, or at least in a form that is neutral between belief and non-belief in a larger narrative of transactions between God and humanity. Such a religious revolution would have four main components. Let me call them the overthrow, the self-transformation, the transformation, and the reward. The overthrow is a response to the greatest spiritual danger that we all confront in the affirmation of our humanity and in the effort to increase our share in the attributes of the divine. Life is what we have, but life characteristically is what we squander in petty compromise, in sleepwalking. Never or rarely fully alive with eyes wide awake. This is what Pascal described as divertissement and Heidegger as Zerstreuung, our diversion, our deflection, our falling apart into a series of petty constraints and accommodations that deprive us of the supreme good of vitality and allow us to die many small deaths. Against this threat, we must bring the resources of a terror. We must overthrow ourselves. We must become, at the same time, the overthrowers and the overthrown. The chief instrument that we have for this project of our self-overthrowal 
is a relentless confrontation with the ineradicable flaws in human life. Our mortality, our groundlessness, and our insatiability. By holding them squarely before us, and by resisting the temptation to deny them, we steel ourselves against the inclination to compromise and to belittlement. This confrontation with the incurable defects in human life is neither sufficient to produce a revolutionary reorientation nor determinate in its implications for the direction of that reorientation. The encounter with these terrors has to be supplemented by practices of society and of culture that protect us against our surrender to the established order of life and of thought. We should diminish the distance between the ordinary moves that we make within a framework of arrangements and assumptions that we take for granted, and the extraordinary moves by which, from time to time, under the provocation of crisis, we challenge and change pieces of this framework. Society and culture should be so organized that they evoke to us their own artifactual character and multiply the occasions to challenge and revise them. In this way, our reinvention of the structure comes to arise more continuously out of the ordinary business of life. And we are relatively more protected against the temptations of institutional and ideological idolatry. The temptation to mistake any particular structure of society or of thought for the definitive and inclusive ordering of human life. But we always find ourselves, in any given historical situation, at some distance from such a reconstruction of society and culture. We do not live in historical time. We live in biographical time. And in the absence of such a reconstruction, we must find a surrogate that is under our control. The surrogate is a transformation of our relation to our own characters, which is the rigidified form of the self. Not to allow the self to assume a single definitive form not to surrender to the carapace of routine and compromise, not to allow ourselves to be mummified, to break the mummy up from within and affirm the supreme good of life. Just as the overthrow achieved through a confrontation with the inexorable defects of human existence 
is insufficient to produce the liberation that we require. So too it is indeterminate in its implications for the course of a religious revolution. The confrontation with the terrors of human life can be used to justify a new paganism, as it was, for example, in the latter philosophy of Heidegger. But it can also be used as an occasion to radicalize the message of the struggle with the world and to lay the basis for a new moment in the transformative experience of humanity. A second part of such a religious revolution is a view of the transformation of the self, a reorientation of our attitude to one another and to existence. Let me describe this reorientation in two equivalent forms. One form is a doctrine of the virtues. The virtues are habitual dispositions to do good. Imagine the moral life organized on the basis of three sets of such dispositions. First come the pagan virtues, the virtues of connection, the problem to which they respond is our temptation to imagine ourselves, each of us, as being the center of the world. The virtues of connection, fairness and forbearance and respect free us from this false centrality. And in this work, they are supported by the enabling virtue, courage, the virtue that makes all others fertile. Then there is a second set of virtues, the virtues of emptying out of what the patristic theologians called kenosis. The problem that they address is our tendency to surrender to the unimportant, to confuse the peripheral with the central. The virtues of kenosis are simplicity, attentiveness, and enthusiasm. By the practice of these virtues, we ready ourselves for the more important, which is the affirmation of the good of life and the increase of our share in the attributes of divinity. Then the third set of virtues are the virtues of divinization. The problem that they seek to solve is our failure to recognize ourselves as the embodied, death-bound, but transcendent spirits that we are, uncontained and unaccommodated by all particular contexts. The virtues of divinization are openness to the new and openness to the other person. A life lived under the aegis of the virtues of divinization is a life in which we cast down our shields and replace serenity by searching. 
instead of trying to stay out of trouble, as the philosophers have generally advised us to do, we look for trouble. Now here is a second formulation of the doctrine of self-transformation, defined in relation to the mind. The mind is not just a machine. It is not just modular and formulaic. The mind is also an anti-machine. As an anti-machine, it is not modular, it is not formulaic. It displays a power of recursive infinity to combine everything with everything else in indefinite numbers of ways and exhibits a faculty of negative capability, as the poet called it, to transgress and to transcend all of its own presuppositions, to see, to experience, to produce more than can be prospectively justified or countenanced by the established forms of life and of thought. The higher life to which we aspire is the life that affirms this second aspect of the mind, the imagination over the first, the anti-machine over the machine, in such a way that we come to live life as surprise. Santayana once said of William James, he was so extremely natural that there was no way of telling what his nature was or what came next. Such a life becomes life itself, the expression of vitality, the power to surprise, to depart from the formula, to break the carapace, to destroy the mummy, is the affirmation of our supreme good. The third part of the religious revolution is the transformation, the reconstruction of the social order. Inadequate in its present form to a being that aspires to a higher life and insists on the attempt to increase its share in the attributes of divinity. Even the freest and most equal contemporary societies are deficient as the home for such a being in at least four ways. First, they are deficient because in their practical organization, especially in the organization of their economic life, they deny opportunity and capability to the mass of ordinary men and women. And they condemn the majority of people to undertake work repetitious work that should best be done by machines to overcome the hierarchical segmentation of the market economy. We must reinvent the market economy in its institutional form. It is not enough to regulate it. It is not enough to compensate for its inequalities through redistributive tax and transfer. It is necessary to multiply its legal and institutional arrangements in such a way 
that more people have more access to more markets in more ways. In such a fashion that the market economy comes to be a permanent experiment in the forms of practical cooperation and in the regimes of production and of exchange. The second defect of even the freest and most equal contemporary societies is that they organize democratic politics in a fashion that continues to make change depend upon crisis. The rule is no trauma, no transformation. Representative democracies would have to be reorganized as high-energy democracies through institutional innovations that increase the temperature of politics, that is to say, the level of organized popular engagement in political life, and hasten the pace of politics, the facility for the rapid practice of decisive experiments, the transformation of social life by political action. A third defect of the contemporary societies as the home of a spirit in search of a larger life. is that they continue to make social solidarity depend on the weak basis of money transfers, as in social entitlement programs. Our ascent requires an intimate combination of self-construction and collaboration. No one saves himself. A higher life is possible only in a society in which social solidarity comes to have a basis stronger than money transfers. The only adequate practical basis for social solidarity is direct responsibility to take care of other people outside the boundaries of one's own family. Every able-bodied adult should have both a position in the production system and a responsibility to take care of others outside his own family, the very young, the very old, the infirm, the needy, and the desperate. A fourth defect of the contemporary societies as the setting for an agent who seeks to become more godlike is the inadequacy of the education that they provide. The role of the school is to be the voice of the future, not the instrument of the state or of the family and to recognize in every child the tongue-tied prophet. It is not enough for education to be analytical rather than informational, for it to use information selectively as an instrument of analytic capability and to repudiate superficial encyclopedic coverage, for it to affirm cooperation in teaching and in learning, as opposed to the combination of individualism and authoritarianism. It is also necessary for education to be dialectical. Every subject, every discipline, every method must be taught from at least two contrasting points of view, the only way to free the mind from superstition. 
these four sets of transformative projects, the democratization of the market economy, the deepening of democracy, the development of a practical basis of social solidarity stronger than money, and the generalization of a form of education capable of freeing the mind from superstition and servility converge to the same outcome. The outcome is the creation of a structure of no structure, a way of ordering social and cultural life that invites its own revision and that dissolves the mendacious semblance of naturalness and necessity. The fourth part of this program of religious revolution is a view of the reward. The reward for the overthrow, for the self-transformation, and for the transformation. The reward is not eternal life. The reward is life itself. Life lived while we have it. To be able to engage in a social world, single-mindedly and wholeheartedly, without surrendering to it. Because it will no longer require from us surrender as the price of engagement. To connect with other people at the extreme in personal love, but more generally through cooperation, without paying for connection the price of subjugation and surrender of individuality. To change our relation to our own selves so that we no longer need to surrender to the character as the mummified, rigidified form of the self, but break the mummy apart and continue to live life as a search. And to resist the dominion of all the categorical schemes that distance us from the manifest world, from the splendor, from the radiance, from the diversity of the phenomena around us. To relativize all of these categorical schemes by viewing the actual from the standpoint of the possible the adjacent possible, what we can do next, the cosmos viewed under the prism of the imagination. Such a religious revolution defined by these four sets of commitments to the overthrow, to the self-transformation, to the transformation and to the reward is not without disharmonies and even contradictions. First, there is the conflict between the overthrow and the reward. The overthrow casts a shadow that threatens to deny us the reward. Indeed, it does. The conflict, however, is not in the ideas. It is within experience itself. It is only by braving 
the ineradicable flaws in human life that we can escape the squandering of the supreme good of life. Then there is the contradiction between the reward on one side and the self-transformation and transformation on the other. The self-transformation requires searching without end and denies us our habitual protections. The transformation commits to practices and arrangements that push us toward such a search rather than protecting us against it. Will we not then find ourselves on the treadmill of desire, of endless longing, satiation, boredom, and restlessness, against which the philosophers have forever warned us? There is no alternative to this risk. It is the price that we must pay for the hope of our ascent. We shall soon die and waste away and be forgotten, although we feel that we should not. We shall die without having understood what this strange world and our place within it are really about. Our religion should begin in the recognition of these terrifying facts rather than in their denial. It should arouse us and it should teach us to change our societies and ourselves so that we become, all of us, not just a happy few, bigger as well as more equal. Then, so long as we live, we shall have a greater life and draw further away from the idols, but closer to one another and be deathless temporarily.